My name is Phil Kendall. I'm a professor here at Temple University in Philadelphia. I also direct the Child and Adolescent Anxiety Clinic. And um, I guess it's been 35 or 40 years now we've been working on the problem of anxiety in children. And something to keep in mind just at the outset is that anxiety is normal. Everyone, everyone watching this uh, has experienced it at some time. Most of the time it's justified. Um, but anxiety, especially when it's irrational, especially when it's maladaptive and interfering, can really be inhibiting and is quite detrimental. Now, the majority of people who work with kids or who see psychological problems with kids might think of you know, acting out, attention deficit problems. Uh, you might think of delinquency or violence uh, or drug use. The anxious kids, they usually aren't the ones who bother adults. They aren't the ones who necessarily disrupt a classroom. But the anxious kids are suffering internally. And if you look at the large data sets available to us, anxiety in childhood is a gateway disorder for later mental health problems. Take, for example, later depression. Take, for example, some substance use. Take, for example, some suicidal ideation. You often find a high predictive relationship between untreated or unsuccessfully treated childhood anxiety and these later mental health problems. So we've spent a lot of our time trying to better understand anxiety in childhood and to develop a treatment program that will give kids alternative ways to manage their anxiety. And it's kind of important to think of this. It's not to replace anxiety. It's not to remove anxiety. We don't, we don't want kids who don't worry about anything because some anxiety is actually quite functional and, and useful in certain circumstances, especially when it's situationally relevant. But the kids who get anxious when unnecessary, when they misinterpret events, when they anticipate catastrophes that aren't real, we, that's the kind of anxiety we want to address and, and treat. So most of our work, as I said, was to better understand anxiety and then to develop a treatment that would address it. Not to remove it, but to teach kids to recognize it and to be able to manage it. And it was right about the time that we started developing this particular treatment that psychology took as a mission what's called empirically supported treatments. That is, you don't just develop a treatment and say it's good, you put it to the test. Uh, so our work now has been translated into several languages and evaluated in different countries. The bottom line being, it's a pattern of findings that suggest anxiety in youth is treatable. Not every kid gets better. We wish it were true, but it isn't. But the pattern is such that you can have a fairly predictable and beneficial effect following a certain protocol. And here's what the protocol is like. You start out, you don't talk about anxiety the first time you meet the anxious child because they're afraid when they come in, what's this mental health professional going to do? So you just have fun, play games, have them walk away going, that wasn't so bad. I might go back again. And then you talk about feelings that are normal and every day and happy as well as anxious. Then you talk about situations. And then you might talk about how to relax. And then you might talk about the thoughts that pop into your head. And then you might talk about problem solving. And each one of those could be a whole session with a lot of homework and a chance to build some skills. After you build some skills, and this is the important part, you don't get over anxiety by talking about it. You get over anxiety by facing it. And so following that skill building part, you then go into a part that could be called exposure or it could be called behavioral experiments. But you then go out into the real world and do the things that you used to think could be leading to a catastrophe. And you find out most of the time, almost all of the time, it's not as bad as you thought. The child who's afraid of the smell of smoke or seeing a fire or seeing a lit match could sit in a room while there are candles burning and at the end recognize the catastrophe didn't happen. The teenager who's afraid of social interaction can interact with someone asking a question or dropping a book and find out 
they don't get ridiculed, the world doesn't fall apart, and that, like everyone else, people drop a book occasionally. So one of the things we like to do is get kids involved in the treatment process, teach them some skills, and then give them chances to practice those skills in the real world. Um, we used to say you start out as a scaredy cat or a fraidy cat, and you become a coping cat. And um, over the years, the program has be call, been called the Coping Cat Program, so um, there's that link. Uh, one of the things to, to keep in mind is that these kids, between 7 and 17, they're in school. School's a powerful part of their life, and the majority of times that kids are in school, the teachers and the school systems do a good job. This is not a critique. On the other hand, there are some situations where anxiety and the problems that it brings to the classroom are such that some teachers or schools will make accommodations. And those accommodations, if it's a ramp for a child who has a wheelchair, if it's a hearing aid for a child with a hearing problem, those accommodations are great. The accommodations sometimes for anxious children actually are detrimental. If the child's afraid to talk in class and is given the opportunity instead to turn in a written paper, they're not going to be able to talk in class. And the more time that it goes by, the more difficult it will be to treat. Our approach would be to teach some skills, give them a chance to small at first, raise their hand, second, maybe just ask to go to the bathroom, or third, maybe ask a question, but gradually do the very things that they initially are afraid to do. Overly accommodating that anxiety actually causes it to be maintained and makes it more difficult to treat. So one of the things we try to do is help educators create environments that can build the skills and allow the kids to gradually expose themselves or test out their catastrophic thinking and find out it's, it's not as bad as they thought. Um, it's not an easy process. I don't want to make it sound um, or trivialize the challenges. Um, but it's very doable. And um, in one study, at least, which was done at six different universities in the US with 488 children, um, the program that I was just talking about as a strategy for effectively treating anxiety in kids was found to have a 60% response rate. So six out of 10 kids who went through the program at the end of treatment were able to do the things that were interfering and maladaptive at the beginning. They had some significant improvements and benefits and gains. By the way, in that one study, uh, one of the other treatment approaches was medication, and that had a 55% response rate, and the combination of the two actually had an 80% response rate. Um, some of anxiety has a physiological basis, and some of anxiety is in your head. Uh, we tend to focus on the skill building part and changing the way you perceive your environment, changing the anticipated catastrophes, uh, testing it out, and finding out that it's not as bad as you thought. Um, we don't tell kids that. If you tell them, they may or may not hear it. We want to involve them, have them be collaborators in a process of trying things out, and have them be collaborators with us and figuring out what it meant that it turned out the way it did. Um, the data would support us. The collaborative process is an important part of a, a favorable outcome. One of the things we're also trying to do is follow kids up 10, 12, 15 years after they completed treatment. Uh, we have them coming back to the university to see how they're doing. Um, in one recently completed study, those children who were successfully treated as youngsters in this case between ages 7 and 13, when they came back later, some of them in their early 20s, we had better functional outcomes for those youth who were successfully treated as children. And those functional outcomes are things like uh, completed education, holding a job, being in a relationship, um, things like that. We're also trying to follow up kids with regard to suicidal ideation. A uh, recent study published indicates that those, again, successfully treated when they're younger have reduced frequencies or intensities of suicidal ideation many years after. Um, we also investigated the effects of successful treatment for anxiety on later depression. Uh, we did not find a significant difference in that instance, um, but we'll, we'll keep looking. Um, 
substance abuse, suicidal ideation, and better functional outcomes, although not depression, are three of the four at least that show some pretty good maintenance uh, down the road for kids successfully treated. So to wrap, um, anxiety is a problem for everyone. It's particularly troublesome for kids who have interference and maladaptive anxiety. It's treatable. You don't just talk about it. You teach some skills and then you practice how to manage it. Mm -hmm.